of me and Angie to stand up first. So at least she said, I'm not going up there, but it's my wife and Angie. <laughs> so uh, I guess you know some about my glasses that are very useful. My name is Steve Butts, and when Principal Timmy asked me to be the keynote speaker, I thought, my God, am I old enough <laughs> to be a keynote speaker at my high school? That's embarrassing. Where did all those years go? We were just here Saturday night. It was the uh, class of 76. We were from the 70s, which was so dysfunctional that our 40th class reunion was in the 41st year. Because, I don't know, it just took us a while to get things going. But it was a wonderful, wonderful class reunion. And for those of us that are a little bit older, you, know, you look back and say, I can't believe time has gone by that fast. And just a lot of memories. In our case, and she's mine, um, we have a long, long history that really starts in 1973 here at, at DeBerg. But I'm like, I think a lot of you in this room um, are just a kid born in South St. Louis. Um, a little unusual that I'm the oldest of 11. So, you know, not everybody comes from a family that large, but I know there's a lot of large families represented in the room. When we were growing up, we lived basically in St. Stephen's Parish the whole time. I'm still there, so that's a south side thing. You don't, you don't go very far, especially when you find something good. But I really, really was lucky, fortunate, blessed to be born into a family that loved me, supported me, saw to everything we needed. One of those things was education. Super, super important. And I said, well, I don't want to give this talk to these kids saying, you know, really you have to remember how important your education is. Your parents sacrificed so much for you. That's absolutely true. But I figured you got that talk maybe, you know, in your seventh or eighth grade here because your people at your grade school said your parents sacrificed for you. And that they do and that they will continue to do. We're just talking about our kids with some of the guests at our table here. And you think, well, when your kids get to be this age, maybe just a couple more years when they go away to college, you know, life will get a little easier on the parents. But I assured them it only gets much more difficult. Much more difficult. These are the easy years. So your teachers, I wanted to just mention, we were also talking about the sacrifice that people that dedicate their lives to Catholic education in particular, they give up a lot. If you have friends or family members who've been in Catholic education, you might know they give up thousands of dollars every year in income. And at the end of a long career, 30, 35 years in the public school system, and they're not overpaid. I've got a couple of my siblings who are longtime public school teachers. They have a wonderful retirement plan. Jerry and I were just talking about the retirement plan of the Archdiocese, and as long as you have a full-time job when you retire, the retirement plan is excellent. So that's what most people, there's a lot of sacrifice for that. You've been given a lot of great gifts, but what I really wanted to talk about tonight, that I want to challenge each one of you students in particular, is not to be afraid of exceptionalism. In today's environment, this is not that new. This has been going on for a long time. Kids who need help, one of, one of our daughters needed some remedial help. We have a grandchild that needs some remedial help. There are people that are underperforming in their schools, people that need help in all kinds of social services. And many of us help those people. But sometimes, I want you to say, these kids in this room do not be afraid to be exceptional. Mediocrity is what a lot of people settle for. They just, you know, it's good enough, I'll just get by. You have every reason to excel in everything you do. You should not be ashamed or afraid to do that. Tonight's a night to celebrate academic excellence, personal excellence. I'm sure Helen's bio that she just gave when a kid like Helen says, I love school, I get excellent grades in school, I'm on two sports teams, four clubs, I volunteer, 
I'm sure that applies to many of you, as we like to say, A-type personalities. Cherish that. It's a gift that the world needs. People that are excellent and remain humble are the people that can create opportunities for many, many other people. I remember, and I'm sure you have too, you have met people that have a lot of great gifts, yet they have this ignorant, prideful side. Never want you to be like that. I want you to be exceptional. Strive. Push yourself. Almost to the point, as I'm sure many of you do, to where you're going to have a nervous breakdown. I've almost had a couple of those nervous breakdowns. Because I was one of those kids. This is what happened to me early on in education. So I'm 58 years old. I'm born in 1959. The 60s, you know, my kids, they, if you tell them Dwight Eisenhower was president when you were born, they're like, my God. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower. But I don't remember the 50s. The 60s were wonderful in, to be a kid in South St. Louis. There were no issues. Uh, we saw stuff on TV and it scared us, but you know, basically it was scouts and school and riding your bike and, and all kinds of great things. There was a lot of experimental stuff that went on in the late 60s, early 70s. And one of those places that people experimented was in education. So I'm just a smart kid at St. Stephen's, and I don't know whose idea it was. Our principal was Sister Robert Ann at the time. I have no idea who would have thought this is a good idea. But they took the 10 smartest 5th, 6th, and 7th graders, put us in a room by ourselves for self-directed learning at a television set. Now, there was no cable TV. This is about, you know, 1971 or two. So we had uh, seven encyclopedias, and it's like you were at Oxford now. You know, it was like, yeah, you're, you're 12, and you're on self-directed study. Well, and we were 30 well-behaved kids, but I can guarantee you this was a failed educational <laughs> experiment. We just receded to the lowest common denominator, which thankfully wasn't that low, but still. It, it was a madhouse in there. I don't know what they were going to do. So we were supposed to watch like the Wordsmith on Channel 9. These are programs people have never heard of, but you know. Anyway, it wasn't working out at all, and our behavior was starting to deteriorate ever so slightly. And we got yelled at a few times, and you know, this is round day, and give us this heartfelt talk. I, I have faith in you kids. You can just, you know, study whatever you want to study. You want to read the entire B letter encyclopedia you can, and I'm like, but for 12, who wants to do that? So about the end of the first quarter, we were deteriorating into just mayhem. Sister Robert Ann comes in furious and says, that's it. Everybody back to their regular classrooms. Fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders. Steve Butts, Nancy Hock, you come with me. I'm like, oh my God. You know, because I've really never been in trouble. And I went through four years here at DeBerg, and I got one demerit, you know, and Eagle Scout and all that stuff. And I was almost starting to cry, because I thought, what could I have done? And she marches us into the eighth grade classroom and says, you sit here, you sit here, I'll call your parents. That was my promotion to eighth grade. I'm like, I don't know if, uh, they probably don't even do this to kids anymore, right? I, I don't know that they hold you back anymore, I, mean, I presume we do. They certainly don't promote you to skip eighth grade. I wouldn't think we do that anymore. But that year we did. And that night they did call our parents, and we had this little powwow at uh, St. Stephen's in the principal's office, and they said, we don't think the kids are challenged enough, but these two can do eighth grade work and beyond, so they're going to be in eighth grade, which actually was great academically. It was horrible socially. I cannot express all your buddies from the seventh grade won't give you the time of day, and there ain't no way the eighth grade is ever going to let you in there. There's just no way. So at the time, there was this new program, similar to the academy somewhere, called 1818. 
And the idea, of course, was you would skip a year, your first eight years of school, and then do a bunch of college credit in high school. And you'd skip another year, and you'd get out of college when you were 20. Nobody ever thought that through, saying, well, what's a 20-year-old out of college going to do? But we weren't that far along. My game plan all along was to go to CBC. That's where my dad went. I never heard the bird, barely heard of it. Back in the old days, there were no open houses. If you were a St. Stephen's boy, you went to St. Mary's. If you were a St. Stephen's girl, you went to the bird. Everybody was sold out. Everything was standing room only. And uh, St. Mary's was not participating in this 1-8-1-8 program. There was only two high schools in St. Louis that first year, Slew High and Burke. On the eve of my freshman year, thanks to a guy named Jack Hannabrink, who was one of my dad's clients, he got me into Burke. I came here with 19 eighth grade girls, now freshmen, so one guy, 19 girls from my grade school. All my guy friends are going to go to St. Mary's. And I'm here with 19 girls. There's 2,000 kids here. I don't know a single soul. I don't know a single soul. Though I could do the work, I was heartbroken on the inside. And I faked for the first time in my life, being sick day after day after day. And I begged my mother, Please let me go back to eighth grade. Please let me go back to eighth grade. Well, thanks to one guy, Mark Tissy, who I met at my reunion, uh, he, he just looked at me one day and said, hey, you little lost guy, you want to sit here and eat lunch with us guys from St. Al's? And that's all it took. One guy to say, hey, you want to eat lunch with us? That was about after two weeks of my freshman year here at DeBerg. From that day forward, I never looked back. I loved every moment from DeBerg from that point on. But had I not been forced by my parents to pursue excellence, and maybe education, at a higher level than what's expected by most people, I would not have wound up here at DeBerg. No one know God, knows God's plan. Right? It's a mystery until you live it. It's wonderful to experience that mystery. Because I came here, and I had skipped eighth grade, you can see I'm not that tall now, you can imagine I was shorter yet, and back in those days, about 25 guys tried out for basketball, and I loved basketball, and I uh, did not make my freshman team, and I was like, oh my god, what am I going to do? I saw this thing that said there is a play at uh, DeBerg, you want to try out for this play. And I did, and I wound up finding the guild players. It was just starting at that time, actually. So thanks to Mr. Leinbrecht and Sandy at that time. It was a wonderful experience. And again, another place to belong. Because of that, I had a plan to be a basketball player. Clearly, that wasn't in the cards. I, I got into some plays here my, all the years I was here. During my junior year, I'm in a play, The Importance of Being Earnest, and I meet a sophomore girl who's in the cast, and her name's Angie DePalma, and right away I liked her. 42 years later, we're still dating. <laughs> we have six kids, six grandkids. So my point there is, embrace the mystery of God's plan for your life. Smart kids, I think, really want to have it all figured out. That just doesn't happen. You know, the old joke, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. But I want you to believe and trust that he does have a plan for you. So pursue excellence. Do not be afraid to push yourself really, really, really hard. Especially when you get to college. You're in this defining decade. We have a wonderful son-in-law, and he has this book that he loves. Uh, the author's name Nietzsche. But it's called The Defining Decade. Basically, the premise of this book is, for most people, the decade that you are about 15 or 16 or 17 to about 25 to 27 is the most defining decade in your life. You are all ready to embark on that decade. If you apply yourself and absolutely do your very best, when you're 15, 16-ish, 14-ish, you're still just a kid. But I guarantee you, 
at 25, 26, 27, the footprint for almost all of your life will be set. You'll be done with most of your formal education. Most people have met their spouse by that time or in a serious relationship, starting the first career. If you mess up those 10 years, you will take decades. You can still be redeemed, absolutely, but it will take decades to do so. I do need my glasses for at least one point that I wanted to give you. Berg has many, many great graduates, many, many great friends. Too many times, I think, you know, we look at celebrities and, you know, you just, you're thrilled to know them. One celebrity, I guess you'd say from here, is Jack Dorsey. Jack Dorsey graduated in 95. He is a billionaire. Not that we're going to measure his worth by his wealth, but, you know, he's done quite a bit. He's a young, young guy still. If you tweet, if you do Twitter, if you take Square, you know who the guy is. He's an exceptional, he's an exceptional brain, a guy who failed in college, a guy who did not fit in well in high school, yet rose above those challenges, was a bit of a nerdy guy, as you might suspect. This is what Jack Dorsey had to say about that. Now you can worry, sorry about that, you can worry about what others think and say. Or you can focus on the opportunities that lie ahead of you. I encourage you to take that path. And then he says, and drive fast. I don't know why he said you drive fast. I'm an insurance guy. Don't drive fast. <laughs> so last quote I'm going to give you is my brother Norbert, so I'm the oldest of 11. If you have 11 kids in your family and there's 21 years between the bookends, I'm 21 years older than my kid brother, somebody's going to wind up being the rich, famous brother. And it's my troubled child, Norbert. Norbert graduated from here in 85. Oh, that's my hook. Time to go. Thanks for having me. So my brother, my brother graduated here from 85. My brother Norbert's a very artsy person, as you might suspect. Those of you who have an artsy side, you got to embrace that too, right? We need engineers and doctors, and lawyers and such, absolutely. But the people that have got great genius in the arts also bring great value to life. And I think to find a balance between science and art in your personal life, in your faith life, is critically important. So always pursue both. Well, my brother Norbert, he did fine academically, but from the time he was a little kid, he was always singing and dancing, off on his own world. We uh, would do talent shows for our parents, and we had a Hoover vacuum cleaner. So the microphone was the Hoover vacuum cleaner. <laughs> And when he was like eight, he said, I'm going to be a big star on Broadway before I'm 30. And I remember I'm like 13 or 14 thinking, I don't really even know what Broadway is. How does this little kid know what Broadway is? Sure enough, his dreams came true. He dreamt really big for all you parents whose kids want to pursue the arts. And you say, my God, it's about the same chance of being a pro basketball player at 5.7. It's just not in the cards. But sometimes it is. So you dream big. And this is one of the quotes that Norbert gave. When I was first in a Broadway show called Wicked, we got terrible reviews at the New York Times. So bad that the show almost did not open. Thankfully, the producers believed in enough of the show to let it have a 90 day run. It is currently one of the longest running shows in Broadway history. These guys, they believed in the show. The critics did not. They pursued their dream, they were not afraid to fail. And when you fail at a Broadway show, it's a huge failure. I mean, you lose millions, and it's not good for your career to be an other loser. To date, 
Just the soundtrack from that show has sold 2.78 million copies. My brother has two Tony Awards, a Grammy for that album. To sell 3 million copies almost of a Broadway cast recording is unheard of. But they dreamt big, so I just leave you with that idea. Please don't be afraid to dream big. If you're going to dream big, you cannot be afraid to fail. You are going to fail sometimes. You can't be afraid of failing. No matter how far you go in life, I want you to look at your parents and your teachers right now, all you kids, and say in your heart, I will never forget from where I came. I will never forget from where I came. Thank you very much.